That old classic hymn is full of every line has great theology in it. By the way, you are saved, not only delivered from sin, but also made pure in God's presence. Rock of Ages, cleft for me. That looks back to the time in Exodus when Moses asked to see the Lord's glory. And the Lord hides Moses in a cleft in the rock because no one can truly see and be in the presence of God's holy glory and survive that unless God graciously provides. So ultimately, Jesus is the rock of ages in whom we are hidden and brought forth before God in his holy glory. Isn't that awesome? That's a great hymn. And in that good news, let us pray to the Lord. O Lord, we come into your presence not of our own merits at all, but in the rock of ages, robed in the righteousness of Christ and him alone, No price do we bring in our hand, Jesus. Simply to your cross we cling. Speak to us, O Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. So today we are going to be focusing on Luke chapter 6, verses 6 through 11. That is the passage or the pericope to which we'll turn in a few minutes. Uh, and the central verse there and the central message from Jesus on which I'll be preaching primarily and to which I draw your attention is Luke chapter 6 verse 9. Jesus asked the scribes and the Pharisees this question. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to destroy it. Some people are so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. Have you heard that before? Ever heard people talk like that before? Some people are so heavenly minded, head up in the clouds, thoughts up in, you know, being so good and so religious that they are no earthly good. That's a quotation originally comes from Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. No, not Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., the Supreme Court Justice, but his dad, the physician and writer. Um, some people are so heavenly minded they are no earthly good, which reminds me of the song that Johnny Cash, and Johnny Cash actually didn't have a son who served on the United States Supreme Court, but a little bit different background, but Johnny Cash picked up on that and, and wrote a song back in the 70s, you may remember it, uh, entitled, No Earthly Good. I'll just pick up kind of in the middle of Johnny Cash's song. If you're holding in heaven, then spread it around. There's hungry hands reaching up here from the ground. Move over and share the high ground where you stood. So heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. The gospel ain't gospel until it is spread. But how can you share it where you got your head? There's hands that reach out for a hand if you would. So heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. <laughs> Don't want to be that guy, right? Don't want to be that girl. Um, because, in fact, Jesus himself says, every tree that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And let me just tell you, Jesus is not speaking as an arborist, actually. He's talking about people and the judgment and the ultimate judgment there. <laughs> Have you borne fruit? Let me just go ahead and also say this. This is not about salvation by works, but those who are saved will produce fruit. That is the message of the scripture over and over again. Jesus says that repeatedly. Now, we have this good news today, uh, somewhat in response to Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. and Johnny Cash. And here's the good news. Doing good 
defeats do-nothing religion. Can I hear an amen on that? Amen? Doing good defeats do-nothing religion. And that is the story of Jesus coming to the earth. That is a central part of the gospel. And now we're going to turn to Luke chapter 6, verses 6 through 11. Hear now God's word. And it happened on another Sabbath. He, this means Jesus, we just had 6, 1 through 5. Jesus has been engaged on the Sabbath, being attacked because his disciples are, you know, plucking grain and rubbing it to feed themselves. And it happened on another Sabbath. He, Jesus, went into the synagogue and taught. And a man was there whose right hand was withered. Now the scribes and the Pharisees were closely watching him, whether he would heal on the Sabbath, so that they might find a reason to accuse him. But he knew their thoughts. And he said to the man with the withered hand, Get up and stand in the midst. And he arose and stood there. Then Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to destroy it? And after looking around at them all, he said to him, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was, to, was restored, totally restored. But they were filled with fury and discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Is it lawful? On the Sabbath, scribes and Pharisees so concerned about what's lawful, you know, upholding God's law. What do you think? Is God's law, is God's purpose for us to do good on the Sabbath? Or to fail to do good and therefore do harm? To save life? Or to destroy it? That's Jesus' central question here. Let's pull back and remind ourselves who we are as people one key aspect of this is God created us in his image to be what? You've got a blank to fill in there if you're following along in the sermon notes. What goes in that blank? God created us in his image to be mediators. Mediators of good. To share God's active love with others. That's the way we're created in God's image. That's why God says uh, to the man and the woman, be fruitful. Did you catch that? <laughs> be fruitful. And he's not just talking, he is talking about having babies, but he's not just talking about having babies. Be fruitful. Fill the earth and subdue it as stewards bringing goodness because you're going to bring goodness so it's good for you to have dominion. You're not going to abuse and destroy. You're going to be mediators of my good, of my kingdom, your kingdom representatives throughout all my creation, throughout this earth, God is saying. Now, after the fall, but notwithstanding the fall and our own sin, God's design of you, God's design of me remains intact. You hear what I'm saying? We're fallen in sin, but the design, imprint, and purpose is still there. So this is really important to understand as human beings. So here's the reality. Because the design is in place. I will. I mean, as a human being, I automatically will reflect and mediate something to the people who encounter me. I will. I will mediate something. By design, I will be, I'm going to give you another term. You can fill in this blank. I will be a conduit. Okay? I'm a mediator, or in other words, I'm a conduit. The question is, what am I a conduit of, right? Good or not good? In the Bible, okay, I know there's monstrous evil, there's satanic evil, but in the Bible, anything that is failing to be good 
is not good, which is bad. Do you follow me? <laughs> and I was just, well, I was neutral on that. You know, when they were uh, lynching that guy, I just kind of held back. I didn't do a thing. No, 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 <laughs> that's bad that you held back and didn't do a thing. I, I had an opportunity to share the gospel, but I didn't. Well, according to God, that's destruction. That's bad. You see, see we're going to be conduits. We're going to be mediators of something, either good or not good, which is, in other words, in the range of evil. First Peter in the New Testament, brings us back to our design plan and our purpose being restored in Jesus and tells us this. Every Christian is called to be, every Christian is called to a royal what? Can you fill in that blank? First Peter 2, 9. Anybody know it? Royal priesthood. Because we're designed to be mediators. That's what a priest does. A priest mediates from God to people and from people to God, okay? And brings God's grace and purposes to people. So when we're saved in Jesus and brought forward in new life, we are then restored to be priest for God's kingdom purposes. That's why Peter talks like that. He's, he's not simply echoing some words from the Old Testament and from the law. He's telling us this is the good news. Right? So every Christian is called to a royal priesthood. We're called a kingdom of priests. That does not mean every single person has the same role in the church or everybody's called to be a clergy man or something like that. That's not what that's saying. What that's saying is we are to be mediators and conduits of God's grace and kingdom purposes. A royal priesthood. God calls us in Christ to be a holy nation, a royal priesthood, and a people of his possession, for what purpose? To do good. This is what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2. To mediate God's excellencies in active proclamation and in active deeds. We'll come back to this. But, you know, we've got this challenge from Johnny Cash, and it's the truth. The gospel ain't gospel until it is spread. So let me ask you to reflect on this as we move through the message today. How are you doing with spreading the gospel? Is it getting out there to the people you work with, you live with, you encounter? Are you allocating your time less on your own headspace and more on people's hurting and needs? Or is it mainly about your headspace and what you like to listen to and watch and stuff like that? Just kind of think about that and bring that before the Lord. See, do nothing religion. I'm very religious. I just don't do anything. Do, <laughs> do nothing religion. This is, of course, what Jesus is encountering in these Sabbath controversies. Do nothing religion. Neither, number one, legalism. It's kind of what the Pharisees and scribes are going to represent for us. But man, you can get a lot of legalists in churches nowadays too. It's not just back 2,000 years ago with Jews now. Legalism, nor airy piety. I had a great quiet time. Man, God just really loves me when I'm in my private headspace with God. Well, yeah, did you get involved in his mission today? Well, no, no, because I, I spend most of my time on quiet time. You don't have any public witness? Well, no, okay, so neither legalism nor airy piety nor liberal laxity. I don't want to leave that out now. And I'm, this is not a sermon to move you towards liberal laxity and like, well, let's just do a bunch of social gospel stuff and it's all about, you know, proving we're good humanitarians. And I'm not talking about that either. Nor liberal laxity is any earthly or actually heavenly good because it turns out God doesn't like that either. Do you know that? God does not like that. We're not, we're not pleasing God with this. It's not pleasing to God. Neither legalism nor airy piety. Johnny Cash is probably in his song talking about airy piety mainly. Maybe a little bit of legalism. How can you share it where you've got your head? There's hands that reach out for a hand, if you would. Uh, nor liberal laxity is any earthly or heavenly good or pleasing God. How do I know that? Because the Bible repeatedly tells me that. Let me just take you to one place in the Old Testament, several places in the New Testament. From the prophet Amos, chapter 5, verses 18 through 24. 
the Lord says to very religious Jewish people who are not engaging in his mission faithfully, who, who have been unfaithful to him. He says, I despise your so-called feast. Yes, you're supposed to come to a feast with me, but I despise your religious put-on stuff, your religious worship services. You're not, I despise your feast. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Oh, we were very solemn today at, at synagogue, at temple, at church. No, I take no delight in those. Take away from me, God says, the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. I don't care how supposedly pretty your music is. Here, here's what I want, God says, at the heart of the matter. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness as an ever-flowing stream. You could say, well, yeah, Pastor Martin, but that's Old Testament. Okay, let's go New Testament. James 2, 17. So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Well, yes, Pastor Martin, but that's James. I'm, I'm really into Jesus. Okay, you want to go to Jesus? Every tree that does not bear fruit is cut down. This is Jesus now. That does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Legalism, religious legalism, airy piety, liberal laxity. All those versions of human religion, whether you're kind of right, left, or center, or whatever, God doesn't like. God is calling us into kingdom mission. So now let's remind ourselves where we're going to go. We're going to dig into Luke 6. 6 through 11 in a couple minutes, but let's remember the context now. Jesus' messianic mission that he proclaims decisively when he quotes from Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2, when he preaches at his hometown synagogue in Nazareth. Luke features this for us in the very middle of Luke chapter 4, after the temptation. Jesus in his messianic mission says this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. That's Messiah language. I am the Messiah. Well, what is my mission? Maybe we want to know that, right? Why is Jesus anointed as the Messiah? Why has he come? Well, he tells us, quoting from Isaiah, he's anointed me. I'm the Messiah to announce good news to the poor. I don't like poor people. This is talking about actual physically, materially poor people, but also people who are spiritually poor. Because Jesus is going to go to very wealthy people who are spiritually poor and bring good news to them. But they're going to be kind of outcast from the good folks one way or the other. To announce good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And remember, the year of the Lord's favor is the Jubilee year, which is the sabbatical, sabbatical year, the 49th going into the 50th year. It's the ultimate year that brings in the kingdom purpose, erases all history, and starts anew. That's under the law, under Torah, and Isaiah is linking to that, and Jesus is linking to that and says, you want to talk about real Sabbath, real feast with the Lord, I've, I'm bringing it on. So that's Jesus' ministry and message. Now, remember, we've now moved on to, and I know we're crawling through, but we're learning a lot from this, Luke chapters 5 and 6. And, and you'll remember, I've laid this out for you several times now, you've got a chiasm with three passages and three episodes on one side, three passages, three episodes on another side, and a central, pivotal passage. The three on either side begin with, Aginato, a Greek term, means um, it, it happened, it came to pass. And the middle passage leads in, Luke leads it in and sets it off for us as, as the center of the chiasm with chi metatalta, after these things, and after these things. So in the pivotal passage, let me remind you, Luke 5, 27 through 39, Jesus calls shockingly Levi, a toll collector, a tax collector, he feasts, Jesus feasts, with toll collectors and outright known public sinners. And Jesus redeclares the New Testament mission, the New Testament mission. Jesus says, 
those who are well, in other words, people who think they're good, have no need of a physician but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, people who think they're righteous, but I've come to call sinners to repentance. If you know you're a sinner, you're good with Jesus. I mean, he's, he's calling you to a new life. If you think you've already got this church thing figured out, you, you're probably not that interested in Jesus. Jesus goes on and says you cannot mix the two. You can't just upgrade the old religion. Jesus says, no one puts new wine into old wineskins. The new wine will burst the skins and be, skips, be spilled, and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. Now, on the other side of the, the, the trio of passages now, on the other side of the chiasm, last week we looked at 6, 1 through 5. Jesus declares himself as the Son of Man to be Lord of the Sabbath. And remember, God is Lord of the Sabbath. So Jesus just told you he's God. He also repeats this message that he's the bridegroom, and he is the Son of Man who's come to judge and declare the kingdom of God. Now we move on to the second of these Sabbath passages, 6, 6 through 11. Here Jesus not only declares that he's Lord of the Sabbath, he demonstrates it. He demonstrates his lordship over the feast, and he defines true Sabbath. For our purposes, he defines what it really means to be a Christian, okay? What it means to live in the kingdom. So let me cut some slack to the Jews and to the, specifically to the Pharisees and the scribes before I get in to dig in for a few minutes on this passage. Remember now, there are key markers for faithful Jews, and they are, under, they are an oppressed group. They're under the Romans. They're under a predominant pagan society all around them. Okay? They need to be distinct. The ways they are distinct are certainly the offerings and the annual feast, but those aren't really ingrained in regular life. Okay? So the three things that are ingrained in regular life are the circumcision. Okay? On the eighth day, boys are circumcised under the covenant. But of course, that's not something you really see all the time, right? You know it personally. The Greeks and the Romans think it's ridiculous to circumcise. They think it's an aberration. But then moving to the outside, kosher laws, purity laws, and clothing traditions but then most distinctly, the Sabbath. While everyone else in the society in the larger Greco-Roman world, in the larger world, works on what we would call Friday night and Saturday, the Jews don't. And the Jews, actually, the Romans kind of in taking over uh, Palestine made a special compensation. The Jews don't serve in the Roman military. They're exempted any of them who faithfully follow the Sabbath, at least. So it's a public profession of faith, and it's a way of marking themselves off. The Sabbath is a big deal. It's a weekly testimony. So now, understanding that, nevertheless, we've got an issue here. And it happened on another Sabbath. He went into the synagogue and taught. Notice this. The Bible consistently tells us that Jesus, every Sabbath, goes to worship. Are the people there more holy than he is? Does he need some inspiration and like, you know, does he need to be perked up? <laughs> no, no, but he goes consistently because he's faithful. People who are faithful come to worship consistently. So he goes into the synagogue and he teaches. And a man was there whose right hand was withered. Luke tells us specifically right hand. Matthew and Mark only hand. Right hand is most important, um, obviously, for productive purposes and for social communication purposes, the right hand is the big deal. And on the flip side of this coin, a lot of Jews would think that if his right hand specifically is withered, he's under God's judgment. Because that's the most important hand. Um, now the scribes and the Pharisees were closely watching. Peradereho, the, the, the Greek verb here, is we have a dog that Nancy says, she'll say to the dog, don't give me your side eye. You know side eye? Okay. The term here in Greek literally is side eye looking. So in other words, they, they are not friendly watching him. They are spying on him. Everybody with me? They are here to accuse him. 
And of course, Luke goes on and tells us this. So they're doing this side eye looking at him, whether he would heal on the Sabbath so that they might find a reason to accuse him. Uh, but he knew their thoughts. And the term for thoughts here in the Greek is like plotting. I mean, it's in their own like little world. They're conspiring together. They're not actually open to the truth. That, that's the implication of this language. And he said to the man with the withered hand, get up and stand in the midst. That's what the Greek there literally says, stand in the middle. In other words, he's bringing the guy to the middle of the, of, of the synagogue, okay? There's not gonna be a little corner deal here. Get up and stand in the midst. And he arose and stood there. What would you think if Jesus called you to the middle of the sanctuary right now? In front of everybody. Then Jesus said to them, I ask you, so you're so into the law? Okay, let me ask you this. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or destroy it? Let me explain to you the tension here. Under Mishnaic interpretation, under Jewish tradition, only if somebody is possibly going to die that day or a woman's gonna bear a child that day can you provide medical help. Otherwise, it's off limits. You have to wait till the next day. You can't do it on the Sabbath. That, that's what, it, and this guy is not gonna die this day in the synagogue from having a withered hand. He's not on death's doorstep and he's certainly not having a baby. This is the issue at play here. Under Judaic tradition now, not, not under the actual Bible law. So Jesus says, what do you think? Should I just let him have his withered hand for another day? And after looking around at them all, he said to him, stretch out your hand. And he did so. And his hand was restored. But they were filled with fury. This is like irrational fury. Uh, alpha and noose, noose means mind. Like they're, they're anti-mind. I mean, they're, they're just kind of crazy mad. They're crazy mad. So how are you and I going to partake of God's Sabbath and really commune with Jesus? As we said last week, just going back to the preaching points from last week, by faith, follow Jesus and fellowship with him and with his church in mission. And freed by God's grace, feast in his presence joyfully and fully. So let's look at our passage for today. Follow Jesus, but who? Who follows Jesus? Who can follow Jesus? Well. As Jesus teaches the word, the Pharisees and the scribes aren't very interested in his teaching, are they? <laughs> are they learning a lot? Is he, I mean, this is the son of God here, you know, expositing the word of God. Do they get anything from it? No. What do you get? I mean, are you here for the word? These guys are definitely not there for the word. So who, who can actually hear and believe God's word? Jesus says, John 3, 7, you must be born again. And again, he says, new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. You gotta be reborn by the Holy Spirit, right? It's gotta come from God. So that's who follows Jesus. You're not gonna follow him otherwise. If you're not following Jesus honestly, actively in communion right now, turn to the Lord and ask him to renew you in the spirit in a new life. Following and fellowshipping with him and his church and mission, but how? How do you do this? These guys are definitely, the Pharisees and the, the, the experts in the law, they are not there to commune with Jesus. I mean, think about this. Do they have the power to heal the guy with the withered hand? Are they going to say, Jesus, don't heal him today because we'll, we'll take care of him tomorrow. What do you think? No. But are, are they going to be impressed with? I mean, is it ever going to like connect with their brains? This guy can heal a guy with a withered hand. He's probably from God. Maybe I need to pay attention. No, no, they're not thinking like that. Okay? Are they concerned with the man with the withered hand at all? Do they care about him? No, they care about their religion. They don't care about other people. You, you catch the dynamic here? Okay. They don't care about the guy with the withered hand. So how can we fellowship with Jesus? Jesus says this, whoever remains in me and I in him he bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Oh, you can do a lot of bad, but he means like good, like fruit. So that's back to our sermon title today. Do
do-nothing religion. Yeah, you can do a lot of nothing if you're apart from Jesus. To actually bear fruit, it's Jesus. Be with Jesus. And third, feast in his presence joyfully and fully. But what is his feast? Here's where we come back to what does it mean to be a Christian? Deuteronomy 8, 3. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So we need to be in the word, and the word calls us to action. What does Jesus say about his feast? John 4, verse 34. Listen to this. My food, what is his food? What does it mean to feast with Jesus? My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Is Christianity just a head game? Just a little private quiet time? No. It's the opposite. It's about moving from prayer into action. And prayer itself is part of the mission. Jesus says to Peter, you will be catching men. And call not the righteous, but sinners. So God calls us in Christ to be a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a people of his own possession, to do good. To mediate God's excellencies in active proclamation and deeds. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. So that you may proclaim, the King James Version says, show forth the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. If you are a Christian, you're telling other people about Jesus. I just guarantee it. If you are a faithful, fruitful Christian, you are telling other people this week about Jesus. It's going to happen. If you are in the spirit at all, you are going to profess your faith and share God's good news to others. Are you going to beat them over the head? No. But you're going to be gracious and winsome, as the scripture calls you to be, and you're going to share public proclamation of how good God is. And then 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good. Do you see that? I capped it for you so you can catch it. Your good deeds and glorify God on the day of his visitation. And then back to Jesus, Sermon on the Mount. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your what? What are they supposed to see? That you're a holy huddle person? No, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father who's in heaven. Just a little preview from where we're going. I'm challenged by this. I hope you are. Where we're going in the Sermon on the Plain, guess how it starts. Jesus says, but I say to you who hear me, love your enemies and do what to those who hate you? Can you see it up there? Do good to those who hate you. And here's the good news. If you're with Jesus, it's awesome because the kingdom prevails. And doing good defeats do-nothing religion. Which side are you going to be on? What's your week going to be like? Your summer. I invite you and I invite us to go with Jesus. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.